Visual novels can be a hard sell. After all, to the statistical majority of gamers, the idea of reading is probably as foreign a concept as a shower. You know the type, Mountain Dew guzzling chuds that would pay an exuberant amount of money for a PlayStation 5 just for the next-gen experience in the one game they buy every year. Call of Duty. This next gen experience I'm talking about is of course sitting 30 centimeters away from a TV to notice the slightly less blurry visuals. But for those with a more refined taste, such as myself, visual novels have a certain appeal. As the sort of person who, unlike the COD chuds, isn't going to be helping with the declining birth rate anytime soon, VNs are more than just a picture book where every female has some sort of deformity of highly inflammatory chest infection. Perhaps the concept is less alien due to the presentation being nearly identical to a genre I'm already acquainted with, JRPGs, but without the combat. Like many with a greater attention span than the minuscule range of a social media fried brain lurking in the scalp of anyone born after the year 2000, I usually enjoy the turn-based battle systems of JRPGs. Yet not all JRPG combat is created equal. Sometimes a game will hook me with an interesting story only to have its less than stellar gameplay constantly getting between us like a third wheel that refuses to take a hint. Ace Attorney was doing the visual novel thing in the West before anyone even knew what a visual novel was. I was in high school when Phoenix Wright was at what I'd call its cultural peak, and lacking hipster credibility, my angsty teen self saw it as nothing but disgustingly sweet Beyonce-approved bubblegum sh**. To me, Ace Attorney was the sort of thing Grandma would stuff in the stocking of her preteen granddaughter alongside Nintendog's Brain Age and a pink DS Lite. Now the 10 year window has passed, however, it's officially retro, meaning I could admit to liking something that is, or at least was, moderately popular while still maintaining my cool esoteric aura. I was more recently introduced to the visual novels through the other two games in what I've now coined the big three of visual novels in the West, Danganronpa, Zero Escape, and of course, Phoenix Wright. I was never really interested in the latter, partly due to Nintendo's, hey, let's have a sale, his 10% off a four-year-old launch title, you America Gin pigu wage slaves. <laughs> Attitude. Which is funny because only a few years ago, Wii's and their abundant accessories had no value outside of cheap alternatives to doorstops and other mundane household quick fixes. There was, however, a more prominent reason I didn't play the game earlier. Danganronpa seemed to have done the Phoenix Wright thing, not to mention bigger, brighter, and more extravagant. To be fair, I wasn't exactly wrong in my observation, but much like in real life, Danganronpa sporting a pink mullet cowboy hat, frilly knickers, and a pipe that blows bubbles doesn't necessarily equate to having more personality. The plain-looking, spiky-haired attorney in a suit might have just as much character as the peacock beside him. I was expecting the plot to do a lot of the heavy lifting in the Ace Attorney trilogy. Like the other visual novels mentioned, it is presented as a murder mystery, relying on hidden secrets and dramatic reveals. As such, I was a bit shocked when the first and second cases just straight up tell you who the murderer is from the get-go. Adding to the premature eplotulation, I've played these two cases before. You could say the mystery box had been opened, tossed aside, and eventually found a new purpose in storing your used and not quite 100% clean takeaway containers. Even so, despite knowing all the answers, the cases were still really f entertaining. Generally, while reading a mystery, the allure of unraveling the truth is what entices the reader to continue. The Phoenix Wright trilogy kind of breaks the rules. The answer to the question of who did it is usually pretty obvious from the start. It's the guy with the glaring character flaw, helped along with some Saturday morning cartoon-esque red flags, such as church organ music. The story comes across to me more like a shonen anime, with a lot of similarities to Jojo's bizarre adventure adventure of all things. While one knows the heroes will win and the villains fail, the mystery lies in how they win. Initially, prosecutors' cases make Phoenix's defendant look overwhelmingly guilty, and watching Phoenix Houdini his way out of an impossible situation through a battle of wits is to Phoenix Wright what lightsabers are to Star Wars, or what cringy Zuma dancing and disappointed parents is to Fortnite. The characters very much abide by a rule of cool, where the importance of winning seemingly subordinate to the delivery of a wittier one-liner than the fella on the other side of the courtroom. Accordingly, evidence is never all laid out at the start of a case, as logic would suggest. How then would the lawyers get bonus cool points for revealing vital evidence at the most dramatic moment possible? It would be hard to talk about the appeal of the game without mentioning the dynamic between the defence lawyer, protagonist Phoenix Wright, and his opposing prosecutors. Phoenix 
six as of the first three games is a prime example of a flat character. Rather than overcoming an internal lie like your typical hero's journey protagonist, he's already in possession of the truth. Which brings up a small dilemma. He's kind of perfect. Flawless characters are almost invariably boring. Stories at the essence are about change. So how does the reader enjoy a character arc without it? Simply, the flat character changes the world around them instead of themselves. While Phoenix may have little to no character growth, he's got such big dick energy that his sheer presence changes the world around him for the better. In this case, the target is the antagonistic prosecutors. To make the comparison to another shonen anime, Goku, the protagonist from Dragon Ball, is a great example of a flat character. Like Phoenix, Goku himself barely grows, but rather invokes a transformation in his enemies. By the conclusion of Dragon Ball Z, Goku's allies, the Z fighters, are predominantly made up of former villains. Phoenix Wright Trilogy seems to follow a very similar formula. The first game consists of villain prosecutor Miles Edgeworth growing exponentially more as a character than Phoenix, and his positive change continues throughout the trilogy. The second game is often regarded as the weakest of the three, with prosecutor of the game Francisca Von Karma partly to blame. While I like her design, she's practically an edgier Edgeworth, amplifying his stubborn egotistical personality, but showing no signs of redemption until about the last 30 seconds of the game. Even then, her path is a carbon copy of that already trodden by Edgeworth, and ultimately Francisca comes across as more of an asshole than a relatable character. The third game's prosecutor, Godot, is my personal favourite of the three. The character's design is the most unique, and his mannerisms the least cliché. His change arc is harder to pin down, fitting the less common negative change or fall arc, where the character changes for the worse rather than the better. Thus, Godot is the most relatable for a, don't worry mum, I don't need a real career, I'll just talk shit about video games on YouTube, dropkick like myself. If the entertaining courtroom ego clashes between Phoenix and the prosecutors are the trilogy's bread and butter, the filling of this VN burger is the presentation. The animation, the character designs, music and overall vibe is brilliant. In fact, the only way I can think to describe it is iconic. The character designs are simple, striking and instantly recognisable. Using Phoenix's design as an example, it's almost staggering how uncomplicated it is. Just another spiky-haired Japanese dude. Nonetheless, I would happily put money on this prick being one of the most recognisable characters in all of video games. The animations and character poses, once again, are instantly identifiable and in a very Jojo way. It's practically indescribable how much the little mannerisms add to the believability and expressiveness of these characters, let alone the tension of the courtroom battles. The music, the generous side of chips that comes with any good pub burger, singled out is merely slightly above average amongst a vast sea of great video game music. Yet what makes it so bloody tasty is how perfectly the music fits with everything else. Think Star Wars' classic opening credits theme, or the Super Mario theme in World 1-1. Music that fits so well you can't even begin to imagine an alternative filling the same role. Of course, the trilogy isn't without its flaws. The most glaring is the proverbial spike pit brimming with the rotting corpses of many visual novels, pacing. One could validly make the argument that Phoenix Wright is presented like a TV series, each case representing an individual TV episode. Most of the cases, individually, have a clear structure and steadily rising tension. When viewing the game's overarching story as a whole, however, it becomes obvious that all of my least favourite cases were filler episodes. These episodes not only don't progress the overall plot, in the case of Ace Attorney, they don't directly threaten any of the established cast whatsoever. Let's dissect the first game. The opening case mostly serves as an introduction, but also has Phoenix personally invested in the case as his best friend is accused of murder. The second case raises the stakes, heavily involving Phoenix's mentor Mia and introducing Phoenix's assistant Maya and her whole spirit medium shebang. Then, 
Jarringly, right at the midpoint of the story, we get filler, the Steel Samurai case. Totally and utterly irrelevant to Phoenix in every way imaginable. The breaks are then released for the fourth case, the Climax. While I could talk about the additional fifth case, given it was tacked on in a later release, it makes things simpler to treat it as a separate bonus episode. The second game's core issue, apart from Francisca's character going nowhere, is that it hits all the same beats as the first game, and like any class idiot's copied homework, does so with less conviction and passion. With a foreboding sense of deja vu, the opening case presents as an introduction to the characters and game mechanics. The second, shockingly, is a spirit medium world building case involving Maya and in introducing a new assistant Pearl. And surprise, the third case is the pace stopping filler. Big top. I could waste time talking shit about this case, but its reputation in the community as the equivalent to a celibate sex worker speaks for itself. While the structure of the two games are eerily similar, the first three cases of the second game just aren't as good as their counterparts in the first. A good sequel traditionally needs to either raise the bar or try something a little different. To be fair, the climactic fourth case of the second game does just that, and is possibly the best case in the trilogy for it. Nonetheless, while the game lands on its feet, it's not enough to save the prior acts from their free fall down the stairs. Okay, so it's the filler cases that are the pacing issue, right? Hold it! Sorry, I couldn't resist. In the third game, there are two filler cases smack bang in the middle of the story. Yet curiously, they didn't make me feel as if I'd hit a wall and wanted to stop playing as in the previous games. This is partly due to the added enigma. The game's mystery boxes remain unsolved almost throughout its entirety, feeling closer to what I've come to expect from a mystery visual novel. More importantly, despite the filler, the game's tension rises gradually, closer to what you would see in one of those story structure graphs I always put on screen to pretend to know what the f I'm talking about. The tension drops midway through the first and second game felt like a sugar crash. In my initial attempt to play years ago, I lost interest at this exact point, the beginning of the third case, and the game was abandoned, delegated to my pile of shame. Another criticism, albeit a nitpick, is that I'd often have to suspend my disbelief. I'm not going to pretend I know anything about lore, but it's fairly obvious when the story takes artistic liberties. For instance, despite swearing under oath, the majority of witnesses avoid any repercussions despite their testimonies being revealed to contain as much hogwash as anecdotes about my loving, human and definitely not 2D wife. Game's moral is a little strange too. Invariably, at some pivotal point in a court battle, Phoenix will ease his nerves by assuring himself he just needs to believe his client's innocence and everything will be alright. Straight to DVD, Disney B-movies have more thought out messages than this Granted, the game's idiotic dogma is flipped on its head in one case when Phoenix learns the shocking truth that not every prime murder suspect with mountains of evidence piled against them is innocent. Unfortunately, this lesson is swiftly discarded by the next case and we're back to just believe. In my most likely wrong Baka Gaijin understanding of Japanese culture, this may be due to the nation's tendency to favour harmony over conflict within social groups. As a result, friendly disputes are seen as a blatant oxymoron. The Japanese are historically known for a seemingly unbreakable commitment to their tribe, exemplified by the act of seppuku, a brutal suicide ritual involving self-disembowelment as a show of fatal honour. From this perspective, favouring the harmony of the group by blindly believing your allies, even in the face of an obvious truth, kind of makes sense, even if it is objectively wrong. There's a lot you could take away from this video. Perhaps Phoenix Wright isn't a game at all, but an elaborate overpriced picture book featuring the lawyer equivalents of Naruto runners who would be laughed out of any courtroom in real life. What you should know, regardless, is that Phoenix Wright is fun. You know, fun? I guess it's sometimes easy to forget that video games aren't all dopamine robbing Skinner boxes created purely for emptying your wallet. Admittedly, the game is not perfect or groundbreaking, but there's something magical about it that I can't quite put my finger on. It's almost like the Super Mario of visual novels. Indeed, if you told me it was developed by Nintendo, I'd probably believe you. Well, maybe not. The Christian Mum certified plumber wouldn't exactly approve of Mia's exposed fumbags. What, do you think I'd make a video without mentioning these monstrous bazonkers?